Welcome back to Remote Sensing Applications using ArcGIS. In this session, we're going to use Landsat 8 sensor data to map burned areas from a wildfire that occurred near Delta Junction last summer, 2013. Let's take an example of a fire near Fairbanks. So here's an area that burned. And here's an area on a north-facing slope that's spruce. And here's an area on a south-facing slope that's birch. If we look at inside these spruce, birch, or burn pixels, we can look at the spectral response. And we see from the visible bands, there's very little difference between the spruce area and the burned area. They're both fairly low in spectral reflectance, but there's a big difference in the near infrared. So basically, as the canopy is consumed, typically we have a substantial decrease in near infrared reflectance. And then in the shortwave infrared, as the canopy is consumed, we have less inner crown shadowing and we have a drier surface. So typically there's a substantial increase in shortwave infrared reflectance in this band. So basically we're going to use an index that uses the information from the near infrared band where we have a substantial decrease in near infrared reflectance falling fire and in the shortwave infrared band where we have a substantial increase in shortwave infrared reflectance following fire. So here's the same relationship that was published in a paper that used hyperspectral very narrow wavelengths. So basically we have the same idea. We have a dramatic decrease in the near infrared reflectance following fire and we have a dramatic increase in the shortwave infrared reflectance following fire. Okay, if you download the data for this week, you'll find a folder, Mississippi Fire. And inside that folder, Mississippi Fire, is another folder of 2013, September 15th. So this is a Landsat 8 sensor image from 2013, September 15th. And we're looking at the red spectral region. And this is the area that burned and this area is Aspen. So if we look at the near infrared spectral region, vegetation is brighter. So here we have our Aspen and our burn. And then finally, the shortwave infrared spectral region. So in this case, band 7. So the fire is bright in band 7 because we have less canopy shadowing and a drier surface falling fire. And this will become clearer as we create a composite. So we've got four separate rasters from the Landsat 8 sensor. So band 7 is the shortwave infrared. Band 5 is the near infrared. Band 4 is the red spectral region. And band 3 is the green spectral region. So use a composite bands tool to create a composite using bands 3, 4, 5, and 7 from our data. Okay, and I'll name my output raster September 15th, bands 3, 4, 5, and 7. And the input rasters are Landsat 8, Path 68, Row 15, 2013. And then the 258 is the Julian day or the day of year, 258. And then our spectral bands 3, which is the green, 4, which is the red spectral region, 5 is the near infrared spectral region, 7 is our shortwave infrared spectral region, and then just OK. And then we could symbolize our composite raster so it looks like a color infrared photograph. So once again, band 3 was the near infrared spectral region, band 2 was the red spectral region, and band 1 was the green spectral region. And I'll use a 95% um, standard deviation stretch and then just OK. So here we have from September a color infrared image. So this is an Aspen stand that's basically been in false senescence. So it's that whitish color. And here's our burned area. 
Okay, you remember I said the contrast between the near infrared and the short wave infrared is used in our burn index. So what we'll do is we'll symbolize this composite with the information from the near infrared and the short wave infrared spectral band. Okay, so now anything that's bright red would be highly reflective in band four, which was our short wave infrared. Anything that's bright green will be photosynthesizing vegetation, because band three is our near infrared, and then just okay. So that gives us a much better contrast to see where our fire is. So basically here we have photosynthetic vegetation. This vegetation is senescing, it's aspen that's senescing. But we've got a nice contrast now between visually what burned versus the areas that didn't burn. And we're going to basically create an index using the near infrared and shortwave infrared reflectance. So that's our next step. Okay, so what we're going to do is use a remotely sensed index called the normalized burn ratio. And that capitalizes on the decrease near infrared reflectance and the increased shortwave infrared reflectance. And burn pixels will have negative values. And if we take a pre burn normalized burn ratio minus a post burn, then we get a difference normalized burn ratio. And in that case, burn pixels will have large positive values. So that's basically where we're headed. And the first step is we need to calculate the spectral reflectance from the near infrared and shortwave infrared bands. Okay, if you open this file that's in your September 15, 2013 folder, this is the metadata about the Landsat 8 sensor bands. And using this metadata, we can calculate the spectral reflectance for any band. So what we need to do is scroll down until you see reflectance multi. So this is the factor we need to use for every pixel value, multiply it by this factor. So basically this would be for the near infrared reflectance and this will be for the shortwave infrared reflectance. And then after we multiply it, we're gonna add this value. So we'll add a negative 0.1 or a negative 0.1 for the shortwave infrared reflectance. So that will give us the spectral reflectance, but then we also have to adjust for the solar elevation. So we need to know what the solar elevation is. And the solar elevation is 28.3 degrees above the horizon. So basically this is in September and it's in mid morning. So that's why the sun is fairly low in 28.3 degrees above the horizon. So I'm gonna copy this. So to calculate our spectral reflectance adjust for the solar elevation, we need to take the sine of that angle. So I'll get in this calculator and take the sine of 28.3 degrees and then I'm gonna copy this, so copy. So basically we're gonna use the information to scale the pixel values to reflectance and then divide that by the sine of the solar elevation. And that will give us the spectral reflectance for each band, which should range between zero and 1.0. So zero would be 0% spectral reflectance one would be 100% spectral reflectance. And okay, so we take the near infrared pixel values times our scaling factor of 0 0.00002 minus 0 0.01 divided by the sine of the solar elevation. And that will output to a new raster called near infrared reflectance.tiff and that should have values ranging from zero to positive one. They should be floating point values. And then OK. And we do have values that are ranging between zero and one. So here's an area that has relatively high near infrared spectral reflectance for September mid morning, 0.31 compared to the burn, 0 0.046. And then we repeat the process for our shortwave infrared spectral band. So with the Landsat 8 sensor, band 7 is the shortwave infrared band we're going to use. 
So we'll output to shortwave infrared reflectance.tiff and then just OK. So here's a pixel that's vegetated. It has a high near infrared reflectance relative to shortwave infrared reflectance. And here's an area that burned. It has a higher shortwave infrared reflectance relative to the near infrared reflectance. So now what we'll do is compute the normalized burn ratio, which will return values from negative 1 to positive 1. OK, so the normalized burn ratio is the near infrared reflectance minus the shortwave infrared reflectance. So this near infrared reflectance will be typically less than the shortwave infrared reflectance for pixels that are burned divided by the near infrared reflectance plus the shortwave infrared reflectance. So that would give us values between negative 1 and positive 1. Negative values would be burned pixels. So we'll take that and multiply it by 1,000 to scale it to 1,000. And then we'll take that and convert it to an integer. So to convert it to an integer, I'll put INT in front of my expression. And then just OK, and that will produce NBR September 15, 2013, and it should range in value from negative 1,000 to positive 1,000. And then just OK. And here's our resulting normalized burn ratio. It ranges from negative 8,600 to 2,008. So it does range from negative 1,000 to positive 1,000. And the areas that burned are low in negative NBR values. OK, you'll have some areas that are also low. So for example, these plowed fields that are exposed soil, they will have fairly low NBR values. So the next step is we'll take the pre-fire NBR minus the post-fire NBR, and that will give us a difference normalized burn ratio. So I went through the processing steps for you and created a pre-fire normalized burn ratio from July of 2013. So here's the pre-fire, and here's the post-fire. And actually, the fire started down here. So my pre-fire does have right when the fire started. So for example, this area is burned in both the pre-fire and the post-fire image. But basically what we want to do is subtract the pre-fire minus the post-fire, and that will give us a difference normalized burn ratio. So we'll use the raster calculator to do that. Okay, so then we'll take the pre-fire NBR minus the post-fire NBR, and that gives us the difference normalized burn ratio. And that, once again, will be a raster, and then just OK. So now areas that have high values are burned pixels with a normalized burn ratio. So for example, this area here has a DNBR of 790, as opposed to this area that was not burned has a DNBR of 33. So now what we'll do is we'll use a threshold of anything above 200 we're going to consider to be a burn pixel. So we'll use the con tool to create a raster of burn versus unburned pixel. OK, so we use the con tool. And the question is, is the difference normalized burn ratio above 200? And if that question's true, that pixel gets a value of 1, representing a burned pixel. If it's false, it gets the value of 0, representing an unburned pixel. And then I output it to a raster called unburned 0, burned 1, dot tiff. And then just OK. OK, so we have some false positives. So areas, for example, that became, uh, they were barley fields, and then they were plowed and became soil or areas where um, the vegetation become very senescent and it dried, etc. So our final step is we'll clip out using a polygon of the wildfire perimeter all those pixels within the wildfire perimeter. So there's our wildfire perimeter. It was produced by the Alaska Fire Service. And now what we'll do is use the clip tool and cut out all the pixels within that wildfire perimeter. So after we run the clip tool, we've got 
pixels, zero representing unburn, one representing burn inside the fire perimeter. And you can see that they match our original composite image fairly well. So if we zoom in, so everything in red has been burned and everything in green was unburned. So for example, this water area was unburned, this area is unburned, etc. Okay, so if you go to the Blackboard website, I've got some quiz questions for you on this processing that will lead you to the next video session.